have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Cynthia Furman, uh, who will be uh, telling us about um, individualized development plan, and she's going to give a, an introduction to herself as well. So Cynthia, why don't you take it away? Um, so just to, as an aside, we have a 20 minute presentation, uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Since I'm meeting okay. myself will help, right? <laughs> um, it's nice to see you all and meet you all. Um, I, I can tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm an assistant dean for career and professional development at UMass Medical School. So this is a freestanding uh, medical school in the UMass public university system. Before that, um, uh, I was at UCSF, uh, where I actually got my PhD training in biochemistry, did a short postdoc, and then uh, moved on to found the Preparing Future Faculty Program at UCSF. So I've been at two public medical schools where I've supported PhD students and postdocs specifically in, first, uh, in the first part of my career, navigating academic career decisions and, and moving into academic positions. Um, and now at UMass Medical School, more broadly, um, helping PhD students and postdocs think about their broader career planning and professional development. Being a scientist coming into career, uh, career uh, and professional development uh, maybe 15 years ago now, there weren't very many PhDs doing this type of work. It was rare for graduate schools or campuses to have anyone focused on PhD or postdoctoral professional development or maybe one person for the whole campus and all disciplines. Um, I was very lucky to train, uh, transition from being a scientist to being a scientist who focused on this aspect of education with career counselors in our broader office, one of the you know, first and still leading office at UCSF. Um, and in that opportunity, I actually began working on IDPs very, very early in their inception and introduction into the biomedical sciences. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that history for IDPs, um, but I, I, you know, my colleagues turned to me quickly as a scientist in the office saying, let's work together to develop individual development plans, a process for our students. Um, a new idea came forward, but it, it really is, is um, very bare and bare bones, and we need to give our students more to facilitate this. Um, we expanded into a 36-page workbook, um, multi-hour workshop series, and then ended up transforming that with colleagues Phil Clifford, um, Jennifer Hoban, and my colleague at UCSF, Bill Lindstedt, into my IDP. Or just now, you know, it came out at a time when IDPs were really gaining a lot of momentum and people were seeking resources. And so it's become, you know, the, the main IDP tool that people have been using. And so in this talk today, what I can share with you and in our discussion are my perspectives based not only on my work with our graduate students and postdocs locally, um, as I'll share with you, we require IDPs on our campus at UMass Medical School. I've read all of them, multiple hundreds each year. I meet with students, I teach the curriculum, so I can tell you some aspects from that perspective. But also from the perspective of having opportunities to travel to you know, campuses all over the country, talking to thousands of students and postdocs and faculty about their processes and the PhDs, um, and the PhDs for the sciences and IDPs. Uh, so, uh, so where I'll start is what is an IDP? So at its heart, if you think about what is an individual development plan, it is a plan, an action plan. Here's a Gantt chart version or a written plan, an action plan. Um, thinking about our population for graduate students or postdocs, for, for you master's students, for example, as a graduate student population. This is their action plan. I tend to encourage students to make an action plan for maybe nine to 12 months. Right now, in uncertain times of COVID, it might be easier to do planning more on a three month time frame with some broader goals also in mind because we have to be so nimble and flexible right now. It's about a plan though that's developed by the mentee. Um, certainly with um, being informed by discussions with mentors, but, but created by the mentee themselves um, to move forward on goals that they feel are important. And those goals might include their academic or research progress, um, but also their professional development, including professional skills that they need to, to develop as well as technical skills um, and any career specific networking or you know, exploration or skills or experience that they need. So to do this, it's really about creating a plan that's informed by your long-term career goals. 
So that's the plan itself. That's really basic. So one might ask, well, why such a big deal about IDPs and why have courses and workshops designed around them? The reason is because there's a lot of challenges that students and postdocs at the PhD level face. And, and I'll share with you that, um, uh, that Linda and Deborah asked me to, to talk to you about from our PhD experience with IDPs. And I'm, I'm trying to be deliberate and explicit about that, knowing that you're thinking about the master's students situation and their goals and how they're similar and different to the PhDs and how we can translate some of these lessons um, to the master's space. And so I'm looking forward to that discussion at the end of this introduction. For the PhD students, when they think about their career preparation aspects of their professional development, you know, it can be really hard for them to even define their career aspirations. Um, some of my earlier research uh, demonstrated along with some other studies that students um, career interests change over the course of a PhD training. It can be also, even if they have a sense of where they want to go, let's say they know that they want to be teaching and they need more teaching experience, it's hard for them to judge how much more teaching experience, what type of experience is most relevant to me, um, you know, so what are their career related gaps, um, to prioritize next steps for their career preparation and other aspects. Finding mentors, mentors who are familiar with the career paths that they're interested in, yet also know them individually and can provide them career-specific mentoring. Students really struggle with expanding their network, and, it, and for years it was very common to have students come in their fifth or sixth year saying, you know, I think I'm going to graduate in a couple months, and so, you know, I'm really, I think I might be interested in industry, I'm not really sure, how can I learn more about that and get a job there? <laughs> As you can imagine, that this is one of the reasons why we brought IDP, you know, IDPs that have come into play. We really need students to be more proactive in thinking about their career preparation as in addition to their professional development and their, and their research development. The last piece here is around finding a like-minded community. Um, and it can be very isolating to think about your own professional development, your strengths, your weaknesses, who you are as a professional, and to navigate different paths. I know when I was a student, it was kind of a lonely endeavor. These days, we're trying to bring it out in the open in PhD programs. So for PhDs, their success in their PhD and postdoctoral research actually presents a lot of similar challenges. How to define their scientific questions? What are their scientific skills and knowledge gaps? How do they prioritize their next steps in the thesis? How do they find appropriate research mentorship, et cetera, et cetera? And so in reality, for the PhD students, their, um, their career preparation, their professional development, and their research are hand in hand. Yet at the same time, often there's also kind of embedded in the culture, this, this pressure for productivity in research. And so it also creates this strange tension and almost feeling at odds between my career preparation and professional development and my research productivity for my thesis or postdoctoral research. And so moving forward, we, we really want to think about how these things are integrated and support and empower students to think of it that way. And it really comes down to a culture change and messaging from the university as well. As we step back, there's been some wonderful conversations um, at the national level, and especially in recent months, about thinking about professional development and, and training more from a student-centered perspective. And so it's less about this clash of these things and is this at odds with my productivity, it's more about graduate education being student-centered, really thinking about their holistic development in all aspects of developing scientists. Recognizing the IDP process as having something to do potentially with um, helping students identify, you know, what their own professional identity, how do their own uh, intersecting identities come together to form one identity for themselves. And through these years of the PhD program, um, these can shift and change and be difficult for students sometimes. Of course, navigating biases and discrimination um, and sustaining wellness of all things that have, have been an issue for a long time. And right now we have an opportunity because they're really, they've come to the forefront of discussions and awareness. So the IDP came into play a number of years ago, almost two decades ago now, um, from a, from a um, committee um, through FASA, the Federation um, for Experimental Biology. And this, this professional development committee for postdoctoral um, training um, recognized that the IDP model, which was, which was already happening in other sectors, such as the military and business sectors, would apply really well for postdocs and empowering postdocs to think more explicitly about their professional development. So when FACET came out with this and in a science editorial article in 2002, um, they came out with a bare bones um, kind of form or guide to creating an IDP. And universities, including ours at UCSF, started, some of us jumped on this and started to really think about what does this mean and how can we actually help our students 
as well as postdocs navigate through this. It's not as simple as a one page form. So at UCSF, as I mentioned, in 2006, we started developing these very in-depth workshops. It went from a one hour workshop to what is an IDP pretty quickly to two hour workshops to four hour workshops and mini series of workshops. Because as I'm gonna share with you in a moment, this is really about an IDP process, not just about the paper at the end as the product of a plan. Um, through this experience at UCSF, um, we and then Phil Clifford and others started developing self-assessment tools to help students with the really important piece of the process, which is some self-assessment -re reflection about where their strengths are and skills are and where they want to grow and other aspects. And so we've had these in-depth worksheets that we developed and coming together as a team of four of us, we decided to create um, a website so that these resources wouldn't just be available when we went to conferences to present workshops or, um, or when uh, for on our own campuses. We needed to bring these resources, especially for career exploration, to a broader audience. So that led to my IDP. We brought the idea to AAAS and it launched in 2012. Uh, it really it turned out to be really good timing because at the same time, there's a lot of international discussion about IDPs. Again, they'd been discussed um, somewhat since 2002, but in, uh, at NIH uh, highlighted this uh, in 2012 in the, in the Biomedical Workforce Working Group Report, and in 2014 brought out a requirement that all PIs on research grants with uh, graduate students and postdocs were required to have them create IDPs or report whether or not actually they were doing IDPs, which was interpreted as being a requirement. There's nothing like a federal agency um, having some kind of requirement to draw people's attention to it. And so suddenly there was a lot of interest. My IDP came out um, and we've, we've consistently gained about 30,000 users per year. We're up to more than 200,000 users in my IDP worldwide. Uh, a few years later, uh, the American Chemical Society decided to create a version of my IDP that was very tailored to chemists. Um, and they created Chem IDP with their own kind of angle, um, which is a different type of process, but very, very similar. Um, I'll share with you some of the collaborations we've had since then. And then the Graduate Career Consortium developed Imagine PhD for PhDs in the humanities and social sciences. So here we have these three nationally free avail freely available tools specifically designed for PhD trainees. So amidst, amidst all this, there's a lot that we've learned, a lot that we've tried um, in the PhD realm with IDPs, but to, re to be frank, there's not very much research or rigorous evaluation of the effectiveness of IDPs, um, specifically for PhDs in the sciences. Um, so I'm uh, actually part of the PI team for a project called I3 IDP, and the goal of that project is to develop evaluation tools to assess, um, to, to put out there um, for the community to use to test um, the effectiveness of their IDP processes. As part of this I3 IDP project, um, it was uh, led by a team at American Chemical Society, led by our PI, Corey Kuniyoshi, Jörg Schlatterer, um, and myself at UMass Medical School. I've been working with um, psychometrician uh, from an educational research perspective, uh, Laura O'Dwyer. And in developing these instruments, we realized that there's actually a lot of different uses of IDPs out there. Universities are defining IDPs kind of all over the place. And we needed to first, if we're gonna assess IDPs um, more centrally, we need to first help the community define what an IDP is. And what we really realized is it's less about the product though it's real, the product is very important. It's about the process of how you get there. So this is a, is a kind of fresh um, off the shelf figure that we've developed through a lot of connecting aspects to the literature um, and to practices that are happening, et cetera, and trying to really understand what are the core components of the IDP process. So as you think of IDPs for master's students, I would encourage you to think about um, this process and also send us feedback because this is an iterative process itself and defining this. Um, but I'll share with you the core components that we've identified are first this piece of self-assessment, really. This is internally identifying where your strengths um, and gaps are, you know, kind of thinking about your own identity, where you want to move forward in the world, et cetera. Um, there's also an exploration piece. So as you're doing a lot of this reflection, you're also gathering information from mentors and others to give you input. Um, you're also exploring career options. You're exploring what professional development opportunities exist out there. At the same time, 
you're prioritizing. What are the long-term career aspects, you know, directions that I might be interested in pursuing? What are the types of skills or experience that I might need to start really rigorously focusing on? What are the area, other um, goals that I think might be priorities for me coming forward? And then that comes down to a concrete goal setting where you use something called the SMART principle to really write down an explicit action plan. And we didn't define this in this figure as a linear arrow set of steps because in reality they really are iterative. Um, it can happen once you get used to it in you know like a day. Um, but often for some, some people the IDP process of going through this, especially the first time, might take longer than that. And so as I'll show you in a minute in our course week, we do this over um, a few weeks of time. As we think about the outcomes, why have IDPs? It's definitely about professional development, academic progress or research progress and career preparation, but it's also about something a little deeper, which is about attitudes and mindset and behaviors related to these things. In the PhD, programs have traditionally been set up as apprenticeship models, which I know is different from master's programs, um, but this apprenticeship aspect can set up the relationship between mentee and mentor, since the, such as the mentee is almost more like a follower and then has to kind of figure out the professional development on their own. In the IDP process, we really want to teach students and shift their attitudes and mindset be, towards being proactive, taking proactive measures towards their own professional development, taking a mentoring up mindset in seeking out mentors and asking them for particular areas of help that they might recognize that they need asking for input on, on areas that they think might be blind spots or that mentors might be able to help them identify areas of growth. We want them to recognize that they can be adaptable and resilient, certainly in times that are un as uncertain as these, that with their PhD training or with their master's training, they might be able to be very nimble. Um, and if they can develop this, this mindset that they're always going to be growing, they'll be creating IDPs you know, in an ongoing fashion throughout their career, it's that mindset that we want to, to cultivate when we do this process with IDP, uh, PhD students. So what I wanna share with you briefly, I'll walk you very quickly through my IDP in case you're not familiar with that. Um, uh, other IDP uh, tools have similar components, so it's kind of a good introduction. I'll share with you some tips that we suggest for IDP um, conversations with mentors. Um, and then I'll share with you some of the things that we've done in our graduate program at the PhD level and strategies for implementation. So my IDP is freely available. Anyone could create a confidential account. Um, you'd go to myidp.sciencecareers.org and create one, and you can do that as well. Um, the, the email address being stored is separate from the rest of AAAS, so it truly is kind of its own database. When you go um, into this site, there's four sections reflecting actually, similar to um, the core components. Self-assessment is a key piece of that, career exploration, setting goals, and then we have implementing a plan in this case. Each part has a quick tips um, shown here and an activity tab. In this case, you're seeing a skills assessment, so we've really tailored it to scientists. In this case, all four of us co-authors came from the biomedical sciences, so there is a biomedical sciences slant to this website. Um, and then in this assessment portion, students can see a summary of where they've self-assessed their proficiency from a high of five to a lower level of one. And they can look at this column of fives to really think about whether you know, their assessment seems accurate or not. This is especially helpful for values and interests when they're doing some career decision making. Um, there is this little link here where mentors can print off a copy of the blank skills assessment sheet and give students feedback on paper. In the career exploration portion, one of the things that have really attracted PhDs to the site is the list of career options. So we provide, I think it is 16, 20, I should probably know, um, career categories here. And it, they're the same career categories presented to everyone, but we decided to um, put them in the order, an order um, top to bottom based on calculations that for, for through an algorithm we developed in the site that match their skills and interests to what people would expect um, for these types of careers. Um, so they can click on one of these numbers. This, for example, if you were to click on skills for becoming a principal investigator in a research intensive institution, you could see how your rating of your own skills level would compare to um, 15 career advisors who are familiar with all of these career paths and felt where your skills might need to be for this career path. We advise students not to read too much into any of these readings. 
um, that it's really designed to kind of open their eyes to new opportunities, not to be a driver into what you should do in your career. Um, that's for sure. In the read about career section, they can then quickly click on any of these categories. It just allows my IDP to be a jumping off point for them to start reading about careers and thinking about them. Um, so we have any section, you know, if they're familiar with the career path, it might provide resources to help them think about preparing and how steps they can take. If they really don't know very much about it, it can open their eyes to professional societies in that space or book chapters or articles where they can get started. We haven't updated a lot of these resources, I admit, in part because some of these original resources were very strong in giving a broad sense of some of these career paths. Um, and there's so many articles now, people can certainly Google and find many more in their next steps. Scientists have trouble with networking often, and so we include example correspondence and other resources, including informational interview questions that students can use as they set up these key conversations. And I'll say that in a recent survey that we did of my IDP users, we found that um, talking to professionals outside you know, in their career of, of interest was the most valuable resource for their career exploration and decision making. Um, they can also set their goals in here. And as they do so, they can then, um, uh, they'll then de display for them their goals um, in more of a chronological fashion as part of their IDP report. What I flip past here, I'll go back to, and that's a mentoring section. Part of the IDP process is a really nice time as part of this reflection piece, is to kind of reflect on, you know, who are people who play mentoring roles for me? And, um, and what are my mentoring gaps? So there's a space for that as well. So, uh, and students can opt in or out of receiving a monthly email reminding of their goals. Um, so as you can see, we really tailored this to dri be driven by the students um, to encourage them to engage with mentors, but it's really a student-led um, pro uh, process in this case from these tools. Um, we added a certificate of completion later in case institutions wanted to use that as an anonymous way for students to confirm that they did aspects of this tool while still keeping their own private data private. So the IDP discussions with mentors though are really important. So I wanna to touch on that briefly. One of the things that we encourage students to do as I, as I mentioned earlier is to really think of, you know, learn about and think about the, the principle of mentoring up. That is recognizing that you have a role in the mentoring relationship, um, being prepared for meetings with your mentors and that the IDP process can help you do that. Um, so the idea is to recognize that you're not linked only to your direct supervisor, but that you should be seeking out multiple mentors inside and outside of your academic institution or program, um, and that you should be thinking about the different roles that those mentors play. Creating your individual development plan can then prepare you for creating a specific agenda for these discussions with mentors. And you can think about where, what, you know, you can talk to your mentors about any of the aspects of career exploration or reflection that you're doing. You can ask them for help with setting goals or achieving your goals in your plan. So as we talk to faculty advisors in PhD programs, we found that it's helpful um, to give them some suggestions for having IDP conversations. Um, you know, this really is a mentee driven process in my mind. And so this is the advice that I provide, which is that the mentors can hold students accountable to, to going through the IDP process. They can set the expectation that, you know, January is a time that that's this month when all of my supervisees have IDP meetings with me. So you're not singling anyone out. Um, and you share with the mentee how they should prepare for the meeting. And then the mentee can do preparation and bring with them an agenda and kind of lead the meeting themselves. The mentor in their role can, can give them feedback on their skills or other maybe potential areas to grow, do a lot of, really a lot of active listening um, and ask the students questions like, how can I help? Or is this plan realistic? Or what are your priorities? Um, so really being in a listening mentoring mode. Graduate programs. So I'll share with you how we've approached IDPs on our campus. And we've taken a very deliberate approach. At UMass Medical School, soon after I arrived there, um, based on my earlier studies, I felt really strongly that if we're going to start career development with minimal resources, let's put them where they can have the most impact. And we decided to integrate career planning directly into our curriculum for all graduate students. This was very different. Most approaches are to have kind of opt-in career workshops where you can attend or not. 
um, and it's a feature of a graduate program. Our feature we decided would be that all students participate and this is something that's just embedded in the culture of our graduate program for our PhD students. We were awarded an NIH Best uh, Grant to fund this, which was awesome, and we've been able to collect a lot of data. Our students are just now graduating, really, and so um, I don't have that data to show you, plus we don't have the time for that. But I thought I would share with you the components related to IDPs and how we brought the IDPs into the curriculum as part of this embedding. So if you think about a PhD program being much longer than a master's degree program, multiple years, we start off, even in the interview phase um, and the first year, emphasizing messaging like thinking ahead to future careers, brainstorming career options for scientists, thinking about how to choose a research lab, and, and seeding ideas around communicating with mentors and having multiple mentors. It's in the third year, um, based on research demonstrating that this is a key time when students' career interests shift, that we have added to our ethics course, our Responsible Conduct of Research course, a whole half of it now is on career planning and individual development plans. And we've integrated into that planning for their thesis research as well. So we discuss mentoring up in the context of thesis committees as well as career mentoring. We, we guide them through exercises where they discuss in small groups and do their own homework around self-assessment and reflection. So we guide them through these different core components of the IDP process. And in the end, they do create a plan which they present in a poster session, which you can see here. We use my IDP as a framework, but I've developed worksheets for this course to kind of tailor it. Annually thereafter, students submit IDPs um, once a year, and it's time to be around the time of their thesis committee meeting. Um, <clears throat> so those are submitted, and I read them deliberately. We don't require their supervisor to sign off or the dean or others in power in the campus to do so. We wanted it to be a more confidential process. We then um, added into our curriculum something called Career Pathways Communities, where students um, set goals between the meetings. Um, so they basically meet three times. They sit in a circle. It's discussion oriented and each community is themed around a given career interest. So these are students who share a career interest. We have two professionals who come in um, who are part of those communities for all three meetings um, and they do various exercises um, to explore that career path. One of the exercises that they do are called micro sims. There are job simulations that are exercises that mimic um, a task common to the career path. Um, so our microsim library is actually available on our website. And by the way, I'm happy to share with you outlines of the courses or facilitation guides for our career pathways communities if that's something you're interested in discussing. So what challenges do, have we found and, and what we've learned about for IDPs um, as we've actually required them? I will say that um, doing it through the course was really significant. Students who did IDPs um, on their own, I could definitely tell, well, I would say, I, could, I feel like I can tell when I read an IDP and it seems thoughtful, they, the students answer reflection questions and then they have an action plan that makes sense with those reflections. And there's other students who kind of reflect and those seem authentic and then their action plan is just kind of a throw it away. Um, when they went through the course, we had third year students who definitely pushed back. Some of them would just stare. They, it was almost like they were defiant in being in a course where they're required to be there as a third year PhD student to think about career planning. Some of them felt like career planning is not urgent. I want to focus on my research. Making a plan is a waste of time, right? Um, if I know I want an academic career, I don't need to plan, these types of things. What we found was that their, their mindset around the course and IDPs themselves shifted dramatically towards the end of the course. So at the end of the course, these, I mean, the students wrote paragraphs of feedback, um, and these are some examples, right? It turns out, you know, I thought that I knew what I needed to do, and it turns out my how was feeble then, um, right? The last one I think might be particularly helpful. You know, it was kind of nice to have this required time to think about topics. It would be difficult for me to justify taking time to my boss if it wasn't required. Um, so students often don't recognize the value of the reflection and the self-assessment part of the IDP process and they skip over that. They write a plan and they're done. But it's, it takes some process and it really does require some conversations and reflection and pondering to, to do this really well. So we've seen some, uh, some of our data, is, quantitative data is showing this as well. Um, this is comparing our third and fourth year students, so our mid-year PhD students from 2014 to 2018, before and after this curriculum was introduced. 
And you can see that students um, are much more likely to know where to go on campus for their career development and how to feel like they're, it's easy for them to access those resources. Students are saying as they're recruited to our campus that they, some of them are saying they chose our campus because of the career development programs. Um, so it's also an asset to the campus in that way. The other key thing is that they're taking more actions towards their goals. Um, and so you can see this is 2014 data where each of the, the behaviors on the bottom of this slide demonstrate behaviors that might be indicative of career planning and preparation. And the orange demonstrates the early stage students. The blue are third and fourth year students. Um, oh, sorry. No, the orange are the mid-stage students. The blue are the late stage students closer to graduation. And the green are the early stage students. So if you look at 2014, you'll see the mid-stage students are pretty close to the early stage students. And the later stage students are taking more actions. Then in 2018, our mid-stage students are taking the same types of actions as our later stage students. And this is one more indication that our mid-stage students are now thinking ahead of their career. They really embraced the IDP process and are moving themselves forward with proactive actions. So I'll just end with, with some of these thoughts um, to leave you with. So how can we help make this process meaningful instead of bureaucratic? Anytime you have as part of your program something like a form or a plan, it can feel very bureaucratic. So one piece is to make it really relevant to the students, both in content, so we use tools like My IDP that are tailored to scientists, but also in time. So our students want to do this type of planning when they already have to do planning for their thesis committee meeting preparation. So their IDPs are now assignments as part of their thesis committee um, preparation each year. And so they do their IDPs in preparation for that thesis committee meeting. The other piece really is to introduce the IDP or really ideally to guide students through the process the first time in a course or a workshop. Uh, with them, with a lot of discussion, less lecture, a lot of discussion, and a lot of activities guiding them through these processes. It helps make it seem real and meaningful. Another thing is recognizing that they're going to need resources as they move through this process. Um, it seems simple on the face, but as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of challenges. So for our students, they often ask, end up asking, well, what do I want to do in my future? What are my strengths or interests and values? I'm not even sure. You know, and how do I link those to career options? Um, considering where I want to go, what goals should I be setting? What skills do I really need to develop? How do I meet more people in a network? I don't know anyone in industry. I don't know anyone in this other field. Um, I know I need to develop my grant writing skills. How can I do that? So there's all these questions that come to play. This is part of this is doing this in a course and with facilitated group discussion can help guide them through this and support them as they ask these questions. Um, pairing them with career counselors for parts of this, um, you know, offering and making available resources and books um, and encouraging them to talk to external as well as internal mentors. All these pieces can help support them as they go through this process. The like-minded community piece is connecting them to peers as they do this. That's part of why I like doing it in a course setting. So as they do this in peer groups, you can see here they are actively creating posters. Um, we had them share their IDPs in uh, an IDP poster session. Um, and the students love this. They love doing it. We have senior students or external professionals come in and facilitate giving them feedback in small groups on their IDPs. I would also suggest being flexible. So um, though, you know, some people love typing in their goals in, I, in my IDP, other people like to list their goals in a bulleted list. The timeline piece is something from a published paper from Angela DePace's lab in uh, Molecular Cell. Uh, one of our students created this colorful Gantt chart that a bunch of our students since have been using as a template and, and they love it. Um, I, you know, others at UCSF and at Scripps Research Institute, they've been having students do more holistic career planning posters as part of their IDP process. And they just give them markers and stickers and let them go creative. Um, so as part of all this creativity and flexibility, I think another aspect of flexibility that we might not think about as administrators or graduate program directors is what really needs to be turned in and who do they need to turn it into. Um, and again, I try to err on the side of empowering students to have the freedom to share what they want to. I have them to fill out forms and turn them into me, um, but we are going to move towards involving research mentors even more directly 
Um, but some students aren't going to feel comfortable sharing or discussing some of their aspects of their IDPs with all mentors. And I, and I think that's going to be true in any types of graduate programs. So I'll leave you with this. I think a key aspect to really think about as you bring in IDPs for individual students or as part of programs is to really think about how to bring the IDP as part of your program culture. So, you know, thinking about this visual, we really emphasize that scientists move on to lots of different career paths. To get there, you will not only need your PhD training or your master's degree training, but also other types of experience and skills and your network and, you know, one part of doing this as a professional, which we all do throughout our careers, is to create individual development plans. Um, so, so we've hammered this through. It comes at them throughout all aspects of their training. Um, and it's really become embedded as part of our culture, which, which has helped to make it meaningful and not just simply feel like paperwork. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think that was longer than 20 minutes for sure. Um, but I'm hope, hoping that it gave you a lot of meat to think about as you think about IDPs for master's students. Um, and I can leave you with some of these questions to, to launch our discussion. You know, what are ways that these core components resonate for master's training experiences? Um, what are critical challenges that master's students um, face that the IDP process might help them help them get through? Um, and what strategies for integrating IDPs into programs might work for master's programs themselves. So, um, Cynthia, thank you. This was really a very helpful discussion and, and certainly um, scoping out the IDPs. I think that would be very helpful uh, to start our discussion for masters. Uh, so before we do some discussions. Anyone have any comments or questions? You can either unmute yourself or um, just join the chat and, and we'll read it out. And I did put the link uh, to the My IDP in the chat. So um, people can go there if they want. Well, th uh, maybe just thank you very much, Cynthia, not only for your presentation, but for the pioneering work you and your colleagues have done and are still doing in this area. Uh, and uh, we are, as the NPSMA, very excited to see how this can, uh, you know, certainly apply to our master's students. I guess I'd say, generally speaking, and, and for us, our master's students are mainly biomedical, so there's total parallels. And I'd say um, there may be differences in um, uh, scale, but not in scope. Uh, uh, you know, to me, the issues are extraordinarily parallel. If anything, the scope challenge, and you know, we may think of it as, well, it's you know, uh, uh, a shorter time and so on, and, but, but actually it makes it more of a challenge because if anything, they face the same issues and the average time, let's say a typical, you know, two-year master's as opposed to just say a five-year PhD, they've got to figure this all out faster. Um, so if anything, it could be even more of a challenge and more critical. So thanks for uh, everything you've done and thanks for opening the door to our discussion. I got a question, this is Ray Hubler. So in, in terms of uh, just how, how satisfied are the students who are involved in the process? I mean, do they see the, the value? Are they, you know, over the, you've been involved with this for a long period of time. And do you see students really uh, moving towards a, thing, a direction where they see the value in this as you've been more systematic in incorporating it? Yeah, um, yes, I think, uh, you know, we certainly still see students who uh, you know, we'll grumble about it or say this is a waste of time, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I don't know that we're ever going to lose that when we're at its heart talking about planning and reflection. <laughs> but, um, but it's remarkable. I, I, in, in the context of the fact that we're talking about planning and reflection, right, I think it's remarkable that for the IDP process specifically, many students have embraced it. And it's interesting because when, um, when I go to student recruitment events, when we're interviewing students, it's surprising to me how often I'm passing by the back of a student and the students talking all about how we do these things called IDPs and they're actually really, really helpful because it pushes us early on to think about what we want to do and how we want to frame our time. And what I found is it's really been helpful for me to you know, organize my research goals, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so they, so many of the students have really embraced it. And I can see this in what they turn into. The earlier IDPs were much more sketch. They definitely need to see some examples. You know, now going through the course themselves and then some of the students come back as facilitators and talking to the senior students helps them get buy-in and seeing students that they want to role model. Um, suggesting to them that you need to be more detailed in your plan here and that's why. Um, so they really embraced it. Their IDPs are pretty complete. Um, part of what I ask them to do in their IDP process is I have them fill out a separate reflection worksheet that includes things like looking bad at your prior IDP, you know, reflect on your progress. What are some challenges you faced? You know, what are some resources that you're going to need moving forward? And it's really interesting. The students talk about internal challenges like, you know, I've been procrastinating too much or I've had health issues and I've been navigating this. And then they talk about, you know, moving forward, I'm going to talk to my mentor more openly about how I can navigate some of these challenges. So it's, it's interesting to see their, their thought process in, in kind of these stages of mentoring up as well. So there's a question um, from uh, Judy Brown. Um, what about documentation of goals, milestones, and achievements? Do you all have a recommended mechanism, or is this not a component of the process? Yeah, um, so I'll say on our, <laughs> a lot of IDPs uh, created by universities do have that as a key part. Um, uh, we don't have that as much, other than asking them to list their goals from last time and basically you know, share their progress towards each of their prior goals. Um, um, on my campus, faculty, they don't call it an IDP, but faculty annually are required to create an IDP. That's what it is. And, you know, of course, some faculty ones, you can imagine that there's a slot for what publications did you do? What grants did you, you know, apply for? Which did you hear back from? You know, what talks did you give? All these categories. For graduate students, I think it's harder. Um, it's harder to have categories necessarily. Relatively easy maybe for some typical thesis research things, but I also don't want the students to, to get into the mindset that their, their future careers are all based on the typical milestones and that they're used to in their thesis research. So I guess that's my own bias and leaving it a little more free flowing so they can get used to the more general structure. So I don't I know a, if there's a best practice there. Yeah, no, no, I, I have a question. Um, companies use leadership development plans. Um, have you looked at the range of different ones that companies used as well? Because that's something probably closer for what master's students that would need than, than PhDs. Well, I've heard, um, I've heard mention of that maybe, maybe from you and our, our uh, brief discussions about this IDP project that you're leading. Uh, I have not seen leadership plans per se from companies. Um, I do know that companies have IDPs. Um, I've talked with HR professionals at companies and some of them say, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to, to look at your IDP process because it's more student-centered, individual-centered versus kind of goal-oriented for the company. And some of the HR developed IDPs are a little bit more like progress within this role or within this company. And we try to make it more holistically about the student. But, but I can't answer that question specifically necessarily. Okay, and, I, I suspect um, that companies do this in a lot of different ways, just like universities do it in different ways. Right, right. And, and uh, they do call them sometimes leadership plans. Um, so there's a question um, uh, from uh, Dagmar. Do you have a dedicated group of faculty staff who implements and keeps track of the IDPs? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So um, in the last few years, it's been me. <laughs> and my assistant <laughs> on our campus. So we have uh, more than 200 IDPs that come through each year and um, they're rolling because they're timed for their thesis committee meetings. And in reality, the thesis committee meetings happen at all kinds of odd times of the year. Um, so that means the work is just constant and spread out. Um, we're now moving more to more of an administrative process where I'm not gonna, I don't have the bandwidth to read them for content anymore. And there's not someone else on our campus in our office who can. So our administrative assistant um, is being trained up in how to just look for some key components and to more just to hold the students accountable to creating one. Even when I read them, it was more, um, I would rarely give feedback because just from one document, I really can't. It requires deeper conversations with students, I think, to be able to give them feedback. But if I saw something like, oh, I'm interested in, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to need to try to find teaching opportunities or a conference related teaching, I might reply saying, oh, you know, your IDP is complete. And by the way, I know about this conference. Have you heard of that one? So I might send some small things like that. So can I ask a question then as a follow-up? This is Judy Brown from the University of Connecticut. Thank you, Cynthia. 
my question was about the documentation and I think this is true for both the doctoral students and for the master's degree students moving forward is after these five years when they've done and met these goals and achievements um, at that fourth year they're starting to think about their postdocs and they're going to be interviewed about what types of projects have you done or have you done any teaching? Can you share with us a lecture or a presentation that you've done? And so getting in the mindset of keeping a binder, if you will, we use an electronic version of called portfolio. I think as we move forward is really important to think about in that for us, our teaching portfolios, our research portfolios, that we can go back and demonstrate not only professional development, but upgrading as far as learning um, online teaching, or you know, we went to a conference. Those things that I think they don't realize are important when they first start out, but also you know, not just writing on your CV, but having examples to share as a portfolio. That's a great idea. Yeah, we encourage our students to do that. And I think one of my prompts about, you know, setting goals for this year includes updating my CV as an example. <laughs> so that's a yearly prompt that they might see on there. Um, uh, but yes, I think that's a great idea. It's, it's surprising. Um, I will say our students have gotten so much more savvy because this is a curriculum based piece, right? Um, they are thinking about careers a lot more throughout all their years. Um, but before then, it was shocking in appointments how frequent I would talk to a student that'd say, well, I didn't think my second author papers were important, so I didn't put them down. Or, you know, oh, you know, the fact that I was president of the, you know, whatever committee was important. <laughs> um, so they often don't see um, the value of some of these things. So keeping track of them as they go is, is a good idea. So there's a, another question. Uh, how long does it typically take a student to fill out? the IDP? You know, I haven't asked our students on our campus how long it takes. Um, I would say for my own IDP process, I would say that if I feel like or the time for me to kind of do my own IDP process, I would I will usually mull things over for a couple of weeks, to be honest, and do some of my reflection as mulling exercises. I would usually set aside a couple of hours or like a full day of just allowing myself, you know, big picture thinking. Um, and then in terms of writing down goals, um, you know, then that being part of it. I, I suggest to our students that they go to a different room than they would usually, like maybe an empty conference room or another room in their house. I would, I tell them that I find that I can do better big picture thinking and get out of my day to day by standing up and using a whiteboard or a chalkboard or writing on a piece of paper in colors or something different from how I would usually do it. Um, I would tell you that some students probably spend half an hour. A lot of them probably spend half an hour, right? Um, and other students, I think, probably do do some of this reflection and mulling process and are, you know, are a little more in depth about it. Um, but, but on its face, it doesn't take that long. I've purposely created relatively simple forms that they can do pretty quickly if they need to. So another a question about logistics. How many workshops do you run per year for your program and how many students attend? And I know you said you also do a class. So um, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So because um, so for our graduate students, um, they're all in one umbrella PhD program. And uh, so there's about 50 per year that enter into that program. The nice thing about this is um, they all do it in their third year. So they knew each other from their first year classes. So I really like that too. They come together in the third year to go through this process of career planning and thinking about their thesis research moving forward. Um, so I offer that once per year in the fall. Um, uh, so that's six lessons, I believe. So once per year, six lessons um, with homework. Uh, for our postdocs, so we don't have master's students, right? But for postdocs, we offer it three times a year. It's, um, we do a two hour required workshop for all postdocs as part of their responsible conduct of research training, which is required for postdocs. And we do it shorter because on our campus to do, require anything a postdoc requires a vote from the department chair council. Um, and even adding a two hour workshop apparently years ago was, uh, you know, there was a debate. <laughs> so we haven't pushed for something more as a requirement. Um, another question, uh, in comparison to e-portfolios, what is the value of IDPs for the time after graduation? Hmm. 
And I could say, you know, an e-portfolio you may share with an employer, but you would not share an IDP with your employer, right? It sounds like an IDP is more for yourself. An e-portfolio is more for others. I don't, I haven't used e-portfolio, so I'm not as familiar. So you all would probably know better. But if an e-portfolio is designed to capture things and then share them out, yes. that's ex exactly very much an important distinction. The IDP to be, it's interesting because some of our research, like some of our faculty um, feel like they're excluded from the process, which is interesting. More, more just because they don't get the piece of paper. The piece of paper is not required to go to the faculty. It's just a piece of paper, right, or whatever, a couple pieces of paper that students turn into us. But the idea, again, is that it's an IDP process. So it's just a guide to guide students through something. So it's really a paper just for them, for their reflection, and we just check that they went through that process. We don't grade them on their answers. We don't care if they made progress or not, et cetera, right? Um, and it's about then taking, they can either take those exact forms and share them with their advisor or someone else or externally, an employer, or probably more likely they'll develop an agenda from those reflections, right, for a specific conversation, or they'll gather a specific information to share with others. So they would tailor those, anything that they use externally. Okay, yeah, and, and e-portfolios are really for others. I, I, I think of the IDPs really for yourself, you certain for your advisors and for the professors uh, 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 to help you. Um, uh, so that is the comparison. Um, are there other questions? Does anyone want to chime in? Um, and certainly, you know, I just want to remind everyone that we'll be having a series of these sort of discussions about uh, IDPs for master's students. Uh, and this was the first one just to see how, you know, IDPs are being used by the postdoc and PhD communities and really try to get them more uh, used by the master's students as well. So one other follow up question, just in terms of using uh, IDPs, I mean, so you gave several examples in the, you know, STEM fields, uh, chemo, you know, ACS and whatnot. What are the application of IDPs to other non STEM applications for graduates, uh, graduate programs? I mean, are there, is it a focus of STEM or are there other groups out there non STEM that are working on this as well? Right. So the Graduate Career Consortium is an organization for uh, people who focus on career development, professional development in their, their university roles. Um, and they have developed uh, Imagine PhD, which is a tool designed for human, for PhD students in the humanities and social sciences. Um, and they found that to be very, um, very popular and effective for use with those PhD populations. So the IDP process really is about kind of this reflection and, you know, holistically looking at pieces, career exploration, right? That reflective process and go coming down to concrete goal setting and that process can apply across disciplines. Um, what they did find is they decided to create Imagine PhD as a separate tool. Um, and they did, they did it in slightly different ways based on how through focus groups and their own work with humanists, they found that humanities and social sciences PhDs tend to approach things. You know, the STEM, STEM trainees tend to be really um, literal and, you know, data oriented and they approach things in different ways from how the human, humanists do, including their own career planning and professional development. I wanted to make a comment and ask a question. So my comment is to follow up on something that, that Jerry said early on. I think the biggest challenge we're gonna have is the compressed time frame. We aren't gonna have you know, the luxury of three years or four years or five years. So um, it occurs to me that where the IDP could be really useful for the PSM student would be in listing the kind of transferable skills and professional skills, uh, career professional skills that we've identified in the PSM movement as things that are important. And I would ask you, Cynthia, and I would ask the group what the feeling would be about us coming up with a mechanism to maybe getting some of these uh, thoughts in front of our students even before they begin their programs. And um, the last thing I would say, during my many years <laughs> mentoring PhD students, or, um, and mostly PSM students in this context, I was always struck by how often their career aspirations matured 
in a two year period of time. So for me, I think the IDP would be a fabulous way for students to reflect on how they have in fact been flexible. Um, and so I would just throw that out. I, I think some kind of tool that we could get in our students' hands early on, maybe even before they officially begin, might be really interesting um, in terms of prompting them to begin thinking about these things because most of us, I think, are in two-year programs, maybe some are three, some are less than two. Um, I so agree with really them. think I'm about compressing it. Yeah. I totally agree, and I'm trying that this year. Because yep. I have students coming in that don't know what they want to do. I mean, it's a program where you can go and do a lot of different things. So I kind of have to start them early to say, what are your favorite things to do? What do you not want to do? And they need to start thinking about that before they even start. So yes, I think it's a great idea. We at Rice University, we make our incoming students to take an online professional development course that we send to them like in, you know, end of May, early June. And it has all these components in it about uh, professional development topics, how to introduce yourself, how to do an elevator pitch, how to, uh, uh, you know, review your resume, uh, look at your career plans, uh, fill in a study plan, write your own bio. It has all these different pieces because we want them to come in in August already thinking about, you know, how do I get an internship? How do I prepare myself to talk to corporate representatives at the career fair that is already usually in September, right? So we try to have them hit the ground running before they even get to our university. So, is that I'll a rice time. course, Dagmar? Pardon me? Is that a rice course, the online course? It was developed, uh, developed in collaboration with the PSM, the, the business school, and the career center. Thank you. That's great. Um, and I saw um, Inga, hi Inga, um, Inga's question about um, <laughs> um, mentor mentee compacts and, and hearing about your experiences about your courses. So here's something. Um, so yes, I think a lot of elements of IDPs may also already be part of your programs in one way or another, whether it's through mentor, dis structured mentor discussions and compacts, whether it be through professional development courses. And I think the key, one of the key things about IDP is that it wraps around for students the framework for these aspects, um, right? And, and, and impresses upon them the mindset that this is an iterative process. So it's not a one-time thing that you do this and now I'm checked and I'm done. As a professional in the sciences, we value professional development and it's gonna be an ongoing process that requires coming back to reflection and coming back to assessment and being flexible. You know, um, and every six months returning your plan and adjusting, adapting or creating a new one. Um, and so it's almost a framework in which then to, to then do the other things that you're talking about, which are professional development courses, mentor, mentee discussions. Yes, and, and, I, and, and I hear you, um, 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 Cynthia. And uh, again, I, I thought when I first ran into the IDP quite a while ago, and, 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 and full disclosure, Cynthia and I were on the, on the best uh, consortium, um, you know, the projects that were launched by the and I, so, uh, and I tried in that context a lot, including bribery for postdocs with um, Starbucks gift cards, do it and all this. And I think in the beginning they're enthusiastic, but it's really difficult, at least from our end, to keep them going back and, and take advantage of this iterative thing. Um, I think PSM programs, as I have mentioned at several occasions, have in my perspective, always been ahead of the curve uh, in comparison to PhD programs and, and different uh, programs do similar things uh, uh, to what Dagmar just uh, prepared, uh, described. So for example, we have an, a semester re co-curricular requirement of participating in a professional development event. We require documentation about an informational interview. So we, we get them going on this uh, from day one. Uh, and um, I, I have not yet tried, but I'm willing to do this to see if I can incentivize them to go through that process in the, um, in the um, IDP. So that's why I had this other questions because what we are doing here
a much shorter program than what you normally are dealing with for five or maybe six years. So I think this time component that Linda pointed out is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want to, I want to, I know a lot of people are dropping off and I, I do want to keep uh, mindful of the time. So I want to, first of all, thank Cynthia and, and a round of uh, virtual applause uh, <laughs> uh, for giving us the talk. We will make the slides available. So that would be very helpful if we could get your slides, Cynthia, and then we can make it available on the NPSMA website. And what we will do is we're going to have a series of these as related to that NSF grant um, uh, to work on IDPs for master's uh, students. So we'll have, um, we'll, we'll continue this discussion. Uh, but thank you uh, very much, Cynthia, for heading off the discussion. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending and um, have a great rest of the week. And most important is stay safe and be well. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you all for Having attending. Me. Hey everyone, thanks for attending. I look forward to future discussions. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Bye-bye. Thanks, Cynthia, so much.